Um, the mystery of Renless Chateau, which which we will discover, terminates in um, Lincoln and Lincoln Cathedral, started in uh, the 1890s at the small village of Renless Chateau in the south of France, uh, where the priest at the time, a chap called Berenge Sonnier, um, found some parchments which um, seemed to indicate when decoded correctly, some great treasure or secret that would affect our understanding um, of the past religiously and historically. Some sort of treasure that was uh, guarded by the Knights Templar. Uh, it also revealed some shadowy organisation throughout history uh, popularised as the Priory of Sion who were custodians and guardians of the secret and um, may well be involved in, in sitting back and watching it unveiling now. And of course Dan Brown's best-selling Da Vinci Code um, highlighted the, the um, belief that Mary Magdalene was pregnant by Jesus Christ and um, from that became a bloodline leading back to Jesus which would still be um, in existence today and, and that that was the secret of Renle Chateau and maybe seeking the bones or final resting place of Mary Magdalene would also be um, the treasure that the Knights Templars were, were custodians of because there would probably be evidence, scrolls or documents um, to back this, um, this storyline up. The fact that all the clues for this were left by Sonia in France led most people to therefore think that its conclusion, if you could solve the puzzles, the many puzzles, that the conclusion would be hidden somewhere in, in the vicinity of Rennes le Chateau in France. Um, they've got that wrong. The clues were certainly in France, but if um, interpreted correctly, lead us back to England where it has always been said that the Holy Grail resided in England and um, our quest has developed into a Lincoln Cathedral code. There is evidence of uh, Knights Templars uh, influence in the area, more than there should be actually. We've got a great preceptory that used to be at South Witham in Lincolnshire, but better than that, 12 miles south of Lincoln Cathedral we arrive at a place called Temple Brewer, which is one of the best remains um, of where the Templars were thriving at the time. Um, and in our cathedral code, there's evidence to suggest that the relics of Mary Magdalene did stay there some while before moving to the cathedral. And if you go to Lincoln Castle also, there's some remarkable graffiti on the walls there, because when the Templars were um, incorrectly founded guilty of crimes they didn't commit and were imprisoned so hurriedly they were taken from Temple Brewer, uh, tried at the chapter house in Lincoln Cathedral and um, put in Lincoln Castle prison. So there's an awful lot of Templarism in Lincolnshire. Sometime between the years 1110 
1120, the Knights Templar found a great secret hidden under the Temple Mound in Sion, Jerusalem, and indeed became the custodians of this find, guarding it from the outside world ever since. Jerusalem is a village in the North Kestavan district of Lincolnshire, England, three miles west of Lincoln Cathedral. The name is unique to the British Isles and has been recorded as far back as 1436. Why it should have this name is unknown. The city of Lincoln during its Roman occupation was also a walled city, like the Jerusalem of the Holy Land. Looking now at decoding the Renlis Outer Parchment um, number two, which starts, Shepherdess, no temptation. Now we know that Nicholas Poussin um, painted the Shepherds of Arcadia painting. In that we see a, um, a shepherdess um, who's quite pregnant. We can see she's pregnant. Over in Lincoln, on the southeast corner of the cathedral, we have a Queen Eleanor, uh, which we'll be looking at. Now, I don't know if people have noticed, but again, she's clearly pregnant. And she's staring over at the St. Margaret burial grounds, where our marker tomb is. Now, St. Margaret was a shepherdess. The fact that um, in Poussin's painting and our own Queen Eleanor, are pregnant, there's clearly no sexual temptation. Shepherdess, no temptation. That Poussin ten years hold the key. Well, we know that Poussin painted Shepherds of Arcadia, we discussed that. Now, ten years painted an interesting painting called The Cabinet of Archduke Leopold in 1657. It's a magnificent portrait, so huge, and contained within it are over 50 smaller portraits. But what is most important is that the central one and focal one that everybody's looking at in there is of St. Margaret. And when we look at the top of the right hand frame, Margaret's portrait within the total portrait there is a green drape hanging over. Now what makes this so interesting is that St Margaret's burial ground the location of is located at a place called the green. That Poussin and Teniers hold the key piece 681. Now, apart from David Teniers, the painter, the French word tenure means to hold, as in to control, to aim, to direct. And we must remember that our Queen Eleanor is looking directly over. She is holding the gaze completely the direction, the aim completely, she's looking directly over at our concluding marker tomb. She is holding that position. She is holding the key piece. Shepherdess, no temptation that Poussin tenures hold the key piece 681. 
The number 681 in the parchment can easily be explained when we go to the southeast sundial at Lincoln Cathedral. It's quite strange in that there are no numerals marked before the number 6. It starts with 6. How we arrive at our 681 is the equal spacing between the 6, the 8, and the number 10. 6, 8, and the 1 in the 10. That is our 681. Shepherdess no temptation, the Poussin Teniers hold the key, P681, by the cross and this horse of God. If we go within the cathedral to the choir stalls, to where the sub-dean sits, if we lift up the seat, below is a very interesting wooden carving, which you wouldn't know is there. The cathedral have called it the Falling Knight alluding to pride before a fall, which brings us back to Niobe and her pride. Now the interesting thing is that we see a knight falling from a horse. The horse's legs are arranged during the fall, they are crossed. Here we have by the cross and this horse of God, the horse of God in the house of God, the cathedral. What is even more interesting is that fastened on the horse there are four visual studs on one side and seven on the other. Now we have the cross of the horse's legs which is the sign of multiplication. If we multiply the four by the seven we'll arrive at the number 28. Don't forget that. Shepherdess, no temptation that Poussin Teniers hold the KP681 by the cross and this horse of God. I complete this guardian demon with midday blue apples. The guardian demon is the Lincoln Imp with the mark of the chalice on his left leg. How do we complete the guardian imp or this scion marker? If we return to the sundial 681, there is a Latin inscription above it, Perient et imputanta. We complete the guardian demon by completing the word imp to imputanta in the motto. At midday blue apples. Now for an optical phenomenon. On the 22nd of July, which is the feast of the Magdalene, at 12 o'clock, the sun's rays will strike through a specific pane glass at the southeast end of the cathedral, 12 o'clock. It's a red and blue pane glass, and when the rays strike, on the stone floor within the cathedral, first of all, some red appears, some blue appears, the mingle and start dancing. This is the optical effect of the blue apples. We have the red apples, we have the blue apples dancing on the stone floor and they will move and make their way and fall upon the tomb of Queen Eleanor, our shepherdess. The um, Rennes Chateau parchment number one, which also concludes in Lincoln, it's our martyr tomb. Uh, for Dagobert II, King, and for Sion is this treasure, and it is death. When we go to the Tennyson statue, we'll see the word King, um, albeit in French, R or I, Roy, uh, concealed on the Tennyson plaque. And also amongst, amongst the concealment is the word scion and both ciphers are concealed in that V notch which is a symbol for the chalice and also is displayed on the Lincoln Imp's leg. Um, is this treasure and it is death. Now our quest concludes 
in a burial ground where more appropriate is this treasure and it is death that is telling us that we are going to conclude in a place associated with death. Isaac Newton was the alleged Grand Master of the Priory of Sion in the late 1600s. The precinct named after him contains the Grantham Library and holds the mysterious dossier known only as Wyville. Now, the library itself um, it's a prized possession of theirs, this document, yet they have no information, they can't recall exactly when it was placed there, um, or who placed it. It's actually dated on the document 1917, which is the year that Sonia died, so I find that quite interesting. Now it's got some interesting references in it, um, such as a stone coffin lying within a small churchyard, it's date not later than the 12th century. Um, it mentions the hidden story written in the stones, which I've no doubt is referring to the architecture of Lincoln Cathedral. Uh, and what king sat throned upon that hill, and this is the hill where our marker tomb resides. Uh, there's also a mystery figure in amongst it referred to simply as the Padre, which is very Sonia-like. The search for the lost cathedral and the lost city. Now, Lincoln Cathedral, many times in a year on a very foggy and misty morning, although normally it can be seen as far as 30 miles away, very like Glastonbury Tall, on a misty morning the cathedral actually vanishes from sight. It's quite a, a spectacle to witness that the cathedral is just not there very like Glastonbury Tall and the mysteries of Avalon and the misted shroud of Avalon which again I find interesting because the patron saint of Lincoln Cathedral, Saint Hugh, came from Avalon in France. I find that quite interesting too. So Lincoln Cathedral is this lost cathedral that the Wyville document is referring to and if you follow um, the quest that's in there it actually does lead you to where our tomb is and I'm pretty certain that it's very deliberate why they've chose Wyville because we end on the hill where there's a Magdalene connection and I think it's a Masonic play on here Wyville is actually Wife Hill
In 1995, the Dean of Lincoln, Reverend Brandon Jackson, announced to the British press that he believed a battle of good and evil was centered on the Gothic Cathedral and asked that it be closed for three months to be exorcised by prayer. Is there something inherently evil lurking in Lincoln Cathedral? Is a malign force in the ancient stonework making the clergy behave like demented marionettes? It seems a fanciful notion, yet this is precisely the conviction held by many senior clerics in the Church of England, according to the Dean of Lincoln Cathedral at the time. One of them, the Dean of a Cathedral, came up to me and said that Lincoln Cathedral was one of the most evil places he had ever been in. A most curious legend relating to the story of the Lincoln Cathedral relates that a sinister evil, perhaps Satan himself, is still inside the cathedral walls. Does the minister hold a lost or forgotten secret, frozen in stone and in time, in this ancient architecture? Was this because, historically, there's some sort of implication, some sort of secret associated with the cathedral, and that that secret is the opposite southeast corner? Is some Templar stash treasure relating to the truth behind a pregnant Mary Magdalene? There is a puzzling word, fricabon, high up on the ceiling of the nave, for which there is no explanation. Decoded, it reads freak up on, and refers to the dog on the plate at the Last Supper. All Gothic cathedrals place their rose window at the west. Lincoln Cathedral's rose window, however, is placed at the north, and is a covert planisphere star map of the northern hemisphere and its stars, highlighting Arcturus, home of the Arthurian legends. The scene of the Last Supper at the Great East Window has 64 roundels and is covertly a chessboard. At a strategically placed roundel we find the scene of the Last Supper which upon Christ's plate we find a dog symbolizing the blazing dog star of Sirius, the emblem of all Masonic lodges. In Greek, the word Sion, spelt C-Y-O-N, means dog. In this 15th century woodcut, we find Jesus on the way to Calvary Hill. Below, and for no apparent reason, we again find the dog that graces the scene of the Last Supper. High above we see Jesus and below we are told it is the Virgin Mary with the child Jesus. However, what we truly see is the Father Jesus above his wife, Mary Magdalene, and their child. Jesus wears a robe and sash that shows us a specifically tied knot. This is the Mason way of telling us that he has tied the knot a phrase that goes back to Roman times and means to be married. Why is the statue of Mary outside of the cathedral? It is because she is the Magdalene upon whom the early church passed judgment and cast out. Alfred Lord Tennyson, poet laureate and most famous of Grail commentators, accompanied by the enigmatic dog. The front plate has a five-petaled dog rose on either side. The rose is the symbol of Mary Magdalene. 
the symbol of Mary Magdalene, the five petaled rose or dog rose. And of course Tennyson was the most famed of Holy Grail poets. Um, on the plaque here, look, we see um, Vesica Pisces, two conjoined circles. Right there, and there. That's a Christ symbol. Um, and concerning the Renla Shadow mystery, we have the zero degree Paris Meridian or Rose Line. Zero degrees. The poem is entitled Flower in the Crannied Wall. The word cranny meaning secret place from the French word cran. There are double O's in the word root to show the geometric symbol of the vesica piscis and to draw reference to the biblical text Revelations 16.22 I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star the bright and morning dog star of Sirius. Okay, here referring to the Renly Shadow parchment number one, um, to King and Sion, we have R O I, which is the French for King, also in the same V notch or chalice, which we find on the um, Lincoln Imp's leg, we have S I O N, to Sion and to King belong this treasure. The reverse plate reads a line from Tennyson's epic 1869 poem, The Holy Grail. The last four lines of this lengthy poem refer to within the cathedral itself. Nor the high God, a vision, nor that one who rose again. Nor the high God, a vision, nor that one who rose again. At the north side of the cathedral, we find the Scion marker on the imp. A wall at East Gate adjacent to Lincoln Cathedral. There is no explanation for this ancient, curious, peering figure facing his east. Using the say what you see code of the Templars and Masons, we see a head peering east. The word peer, spelt P-I-E-R, is an architectural term meaning the support of an arch. At the head of the easternmost pier within the cathedral, we find the deliberate placing of the demon guardian, Lincoln Imp. The Templars were imprisoned at the castle following their arrest at the Preceptory at Temple Brewer, 13 miles south. Uh, we're just about to go to Cobb Hall where there's some amazing Templar graffiti on the walls, um, quite interesting and pertaining to the Cathedral Code, and also where the Templars were imprisoned, having been arrested at Temple Brewer. Is still remarkably preserved Templar graffiti on the prison walls. One in particular appears to be telling us something. The knight shows us an arrangement of four fingers on one hand and five on the other with a cross behind him. Crossing or multiplying the five by four we arrive at the number 20 
the number of the fifth down and fourth across roundel at the great east window where there is placed the dog on the platter. The observatory tower built in 1807. What was it built to observe? Something precious, perhaps a secret known only to its custodians. The entrance has a curious chiseled doorway, as if to bring in or take out something far wider. Perhaps a chest or sarcophagus relating to Mary Magdalene. What does this triangular device with a window in the middle mean? The window in the middle refers to the great east window of Lincoln Cathedral that contains the dog on the platter at the scene of the Last Supper. The design of the device is that of a manger, the Masonic symbolism revealing the phrase dog in a manger. This expression is meant to describe someone who has something of value that they cannot or will not use themselves, but which they won't let any other use either the secrets of Mary Magdalene. The Legend of the Briar Rose is a series of paintings by the pre-Raphaelite artist Edward Byrne Jones, completed between 1885 and 1890. The fourth in the series, The Rose Bowers, refers to the sleeping Magdalene and is associated with Brewer where the Templar legend of the nearby small hamlet of Bayard's Leap contains the anagram Bride Asleep. The cryptic poem that accompanies the painting reads, Here lies the hoarded love, the key, to all the treasure that shall be. Come fated heart, the gift to take, and smite the sleeping world awake. Here lies the whore dead, the key to all the treasure that shall be. At the time Temple Brewer was thriving, there was an equally thriving Jewish community in Lincoln. Had the secret guarded by the Templars made its way to Temple Brewer from RLC before moving the short distance to opposite Lincoln Cathedral? Cathedral Court um, suggests to me that Brewer has played an important part uh, in that 
attempt a treasure, I think may well have stayed here in a crypt which is still at Brewer and moved on to uh, the southeast corner of the cathedral and St Margaret's Church. Tunnels of the Temple Brewer, the ones that we do know of, no access points sadly, is exactly here and um, along here. And the underground crypt is here, Mary Magdalene, en route to Lincoln Cathedral, may have been conceived here. Uh, from France. Seventeen seventy-eight. Some good Masonic uh, signatures going back to the early uh, 18th century. Actually, WB Worshipful Brother. Um, this hasn't always been like this. About a year ago, um, I noticed that somebody had expertly removed a, uh, expertly removed. Uh, these bricks. Um, I don't know why they've chose this spot. Um, we have our strange triangle on the wall on the other side. Um, I don't know why they've chose this spot at all. The bricks haven't been put back since they've been removed. But believe you me, it's quite a good hidey hole in there whether there ever was anything or whether somebody's perhaps been in and removed something I don't know and it certainly wouldn't surprise me <sighs> we need some super glue The Cathedral of Wyville ends at the top of a hill with a spring head, five houses and the word Thalassa, in Greek meaning water. Grail intrepid René de Anjou, King of Naples and Sicily and Grand Master of the Priory of Sion from 1418 to 1480, who spent his life searching for the Magdalene painted his cryptic La Fontaine de Fortune, a fallen knight alongside a knight who stands by a monument whose inscription warns against bitter water. The knight looks into his hand, duplicating Lord Tennyson at his statue. The scene represents the broad esoteric current coined by René as the underground stream of lost Arcadia. Lincoln conceals its own um, hidden Arcadia, which is quite germane to the Wren mystery. Uh, you know, Lincoln is, is strongly Roman, it has Roman settlements, there's still evidence of that there now. So why should we have this hidden Greek influence? Now if we go to Temple Gardens, which is right next to the cathedral, um, there is a temple built there which copies the Sharagic monument of Thrasyllus very Grecian indeed. Now if we go to that monument at the very top is a lady in Greek mythology called Niobe. Now in a way Niobe kind of upset um, the Greek goddesses with her arrogance and pride. So much so that she was punished for that and turned to stone. Now the two key words that leap out here 
as pride and stone. Now what makes this so important is that in the Germanic Grail legend, the two key words is pride and stone, whereas Lucifer was thrown out of heaven for his pride and during the incident a stone was dislodged from his crown and fell to the earth, a green stone. Now if we go to Greestone Place, it's very almost the same as Greenstone actually, but when we go to Greestone Place, which is um, the steps that lead us to our, our, our final location, we find that this was originally called Grecian Place. The old nameplates are still there, faded, you can see. So we're a bit unsure why that had been altered to remove the Grecian influence again. Now, the word Greece stone um, is formulated from the compound word Grease in the word degrees, as in masonry, the 33 degrees. Uh, it, degrees also means a step in a direct hereditary line of ascent, which brings us back to our Magdalene connection in our marker tomb. And the steps, of course, Greystone stairs, lead us again to the very precise location where all this terminates. Another clue, uh, albeit deposited in France, that, that um, leads us to Lincoln and, and, and our concluding marker to uh, concerns the French noblewoman Marie de Nigue. Um, we don't argue that she actually knew the secret, this is quite accepted. And on her deathbed in 1781, she confided the secret to um, a priest called Abbe Bijou. Now, when Marie died, coincidentally, and there's no such thing as a, a meaningless coincidence. The St. Margaret Church in Lincoln was destroyed in the very same year. So to lots of people, the secret was lost once and for all with Marie's demise and the demolishing of the church. But um, this Abbe Bijou, um, some time after Marie's death, erected um, a horizontal headstone and a vertical slab stone with Clues encrypted into both. Um, Sonia found these uh, amongst his travels and actually destroyed them, but they'd already been recorded. Now, if we employ a rather um, complex code, and it's it employs a skip sequence. Now, there's two examples of three couplets, two of two couplets seven of one letter, four examples of a gap spacing of four, two of a gap of seven, two of a gap of sixteen, one of a gap of twelve, one of a gap of twenty-four with the key numbers divisible into twelve, sixteen and twenty-four, the cord is broken and it actually reveals Margaret at Lincoln. And when we look at the um, secondary um, slab stone there's an octopus figure on there, an octopus, eight legs, eight feet, suggesting that eight feet down at our marker tomb is exactly the object or objects that we are looking for. And it's also interesting that an octopus is a marine mollusk and St. Margaret in the east was known as Marina. And we must remember that the octopus, of course, is an acknowledged symbol of the Priory Zion.
Um, another clue, again deposited in France, which leads us over to Lincoln and our um, marker tomb, was provided by a French researcher called André Duzet. Now he produced a model map or maquette entitled Jerusalem, which apparently was commissioned by Saunier two years before his death. Now whereas the Rennes um, Brigade argue that it's um, showing topography in France and around the rennes le Chateau region, um, surprisingly enough to those people, it also matches the topography in Lincoln and the area that we're concentrating on. It has the, the area of the castle, the cathedral. Um, the maquette is supposed to show two tombs. Now, whereas it's called Jerusalem, it clearly is not of, of the Holy Land, but we must remember that in Lincoln we have our own Jerusalem, of which little is known about. But what is uh, conclusive for me and lots of other people is that where one of the tombs on the maquette um, terminates, it matches exactly where our Lincoln Cathedral marker tomb is too. And even on the map, it's kind of color kind of green, even, which again is interesting because of what we've, we've discovered about Greece stone stairs, the so-called stone in Lucifer's crown being green. Beyond coincidence. In the Museum of Antwerp, there is a painting called The Invocation, which was painted by a Belgian artist um, calling himself Eugene Samain. Now, it's also been used on a cover of a book in France by the author Alfred Wayson, and his book was called um, The Island of the Watchman. What makes it interesting to me that this image is being used and reproduced is that Wayson actually met and knew Philip de Cherisy, who most people associate with um, the Wren parchments. When we take a look at this fascinating painting, there's so much that catches the eye immediately. We have a, 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 a headless female in a coffin with no lid on it. Um, we can come back to this when we discuss uh, the tomb of the unnamed woman in Lincoln Cathedral, because again, we will see the similarities with a headless female in a coffin with no lid. So obviously the two are connected. Um, for those who know Lincoln Cathedral, we can identify that this painting is at the southeast corner. We can tell by the stonework, and there's a guardian sitting there. Now, his orientation is such that he is facing St. Margaret's burial ground. Um, he's holding a thistle in his hand. Now, the thistle, in Latin, translates into the word God do which in tarot, with the Masonic Pleon, we have card two, which is the High Priestess, which is an appellation afforded Mary Magdalene. Who can the painting be looking at, this, this, this female with her covered head? The seat that the Guardian is sitting on, we can clearly see, shows the Seal of Solomon, the Jewish symbol. When we look at this interesting guardian's tunic, we can count four buttons, two, three, four, followed, sequentially followed by seven small squares containing a cross. If we take the four and the seven and multiply them, we'll arrive at 28, which has occurred more than once in this mystery. Now, the lady um, in the coffin is pointing at what appears to be a green pearl. The name green originates from one who dwells at a grassy mound. Or it can also mean the green hill, which of course is describing yet again St. Margaret's burial ground where we are constantly being led back to. 
Now she's pointing at a green pearl. And the word pearl comes from the Greek form of the name Margaret. So all in all, what this painting is telling us is plot 28, St. Margaret on the hill, opposite the southeast corner of Lincoln Cathedral, is the Jewish high priestess, Mary Magdalene. And also, to conclude, the silhouette at the background of the painting is a clear outline of a certain part of Lincoln Castle. So the orientation in the painting is beyond doubt. The tomb bears the family name Rainer, which can be pronounced Rain, meaning French for Queen. We see both biblical names Martha and Mary. There is no explanation why two tombs are so adjoined together. The scene replicating the headstone of René de Anjou's La Fontaine de Fortune and its adjoining tro. The Church of Shepherdess St. Margaret, a virgin saint and yet strangely patron of pregnant women. Her church was destroyed in 1781, the year that Marie de Negre died, in the belief that the secret location would be lost forever. Now then, the tomb of the unnamed woman. This is, this is really fascinating. The week that um, Hollywood came to film the Lincoln Da Vinci Code at the cathedral meant that uh, workmen, electricians, had to dig some extra cable to provide the lighting for the, the film. Now whilst they were doing this, they discovered a tomb which nobody knew existed. The tomb has no lid on it and it has been, the archaeologists have confirmed, a headless woman contained within there. We find this at the southeast corner of the southwest transept. Apparently this had also been discovered in the 60s by workmen going about their business again, but even less attention was paid to it, it was just recovered and left alone. This is the red herring in the Lincoln Cathedral Da Vinci Code. If there had been a whisper that there was some lost tomb in the area containing the bones or some treasures of Mary Magdalene, I feel that this was placed so that people may find it and seek no further. The actual tomb that we have discovered and located is only a matter of hundreds of yards away from this spot. Now how can Lincoln Cathedral have a tomb that nobody knows existed with all the protocol that you need to be buried in such a privileged place? There's no records nothing whatsoever, no information whatsoever of this tomb which was accidentally discovered. We must also remember uh, the Templars worshipped a skull and if we go to St. Margaret's burial grounds, St. Margaret of course ended her days decapitated. The um, Mary Magdalene base relief, P 
painting in the Renle Chateau church, which Sonia did himself. Crucial clue. Now, I discovered if we take a straight line through the eye level of the kneeling Magdala, continue it through to the center of her cross, it hits on a strategic part of the outside design, tomb shape design actually, and um, some refer to it as dog teeth. But if you count from um, the left to the right, it hits exactly on the tomb shape, number 28. And of course, when we go to our St. Margaret's burial grounds in Lincoln, archaeologists have listed 56 tombs there. And this, the one that um, is our marker tomb is number 28 of the 56. I should also like to point out that um, British um, sacred geometrist David Wood, when he examined the Poussin tomb in France before it was demolished in 1988, it actually had 56 face stones. So again, there's a correlation between the Poussin tomb and the St. Margaret's burial grounds. And uh, the Mary Magdalene uh, figure in the base relief, uh, we've mentioned the centre of her cross, the cross that's in the painting is exactly the same cross that St. Margaret always carried with her. Also in the painting we see a skull which again is telling us we're in some way associated with death. We are on a burial ground. And of course when we look at um, the scenery to the left of Mary, it matches exactly with our orientation in the burial grounds telling us that we've got this absolutely correct Wixie Lincoln Castle in the background. In the distance we see Lincoln Castle. To its right we see the west gate of Exchequer Gate that one passes through to the west front of the cathedral. And to the right again we see the steep high hill upon which the cathedral was built. Now why the number 28? The 28th day is the continuing cycle in the uterus that leads to pregnancy. St. Margaret, of course, although a virgin saint, was also the patron of pregnant women. How strange. The sacred feminine painting in the Lincoln Cathedral. Now in 1800, a former Royal Academy member, um, painter Matthew William Peters, he was quite well known um, for um, his paintings of mildly salacious women. Now, he quit the art world to join the church and actually ended up becoming canon of Lincoln Cathedral where he painted this well it's called the Annunciation it's supposed to be the Virgin Mary but you can clearly say we're not looking at the Virgin Mary the figure we're looking at here is Mary Magdalene the red hair the red garb it's clearly an image of the sacred feminine. Um, Margaret St Starbird has seen this painting and she agrees with me this is clearly a representation of the sacred feminine as opposed to the, the Virgin Mary. Um, it was originally placed behind the high altar but in 1856, the year after our mysterious dog on the plate popped up at the Great East Window it was removed and put in a dusty corner in the Triforium at the northeast transept of Lincoln Cathedral. Now, you can clearly see that the person's pregnant and she's looking over at a black, small monolith which upon it seems to have two scrolls, it looks like, parchments or scrolls. 
The monolith she's looking at is identical to our Lincoln Cathedral Martyr Tomb. Mary rests in her hidden underground sanctuary, staring up at the cross that is always carried by St. Margaret. With a skull at her feet, the skull and cross indicating that we are at a place involving death and burial, the burial grounds of St. Margaret. If we look at the pouch above her hands, we see a right angle removed, or southeast corner, indicating we are close to the southeast corner of the cathedral. Her joined hands show a representation of the grease stone steps that lead to grease stone place and to her Margaret's burial grounds. A stained glass window within the church at RLC shows Mary, Martha, and Jesus. In the middle of the gathering, we see the Lincoln Cathedral code marker tomb with a cross upon it to hint we are at a church. The name on the marker tomb is Martha and adjoining it, Mary. The ground penetrating radar scan that never was. Now, when I concluded my work and presented it in um, two small boot forms and it reached the media. Um, it's a local newspaper story. Um, the next stage for me was to approach the cathedral and say, look, you know, we really need to be having a ground radar scan at this precise area, this tomb that's in the Margaret burial ground because GPR scanning will reveal if there's anything there or not. Now what we're looking for is, is underneath a tomb, an existing tomb, at a depth, there's a crypt that's containing whatever the Templars are guarding. So I approached the cathedral um, and um, to quote from this, um, the chief executive um, said to me, regards the GPR scan, there should be no problem with the research. Um, he goes on to say, if this is just a radar survey that will have no structural impact, then I can't see a problem. But if something else comes up and we're talking about excavation, then things get more complicated. But anyway, um, I was more or less promised that I'd have my GPR scan. There's no structural damage or anything like that. So everybody's anticipating this. And then when it got near the time in the spring, the following spring, the cathedral rescinded. And suddenly, no, you can't have permission for your scan. Now I was willing to pay for this myself. I got uh, the best company in the land. They discovered tombs uh, at Westminster. They even fought my corner when the cathedral did this amazing U-turn. Uh, so it wasn't going to cost them anything, no structural damage, nothing. Uh, and then they kind of changed their mind and went silent on this. And nobody can really work out why. They just didn't let me do that. And it doesn't look like I will change their mind. And people have said to me, you know, um, they like to play my work down, obviously, because it, it's um, contrary to what they may be saying historically. Now, if they um, don't want to take me serious, as they often indicate in, in the media, and don't really think I'm actually um, on anything I've got this accurate, if they really, really, really believe that, then why don't they let me have my scan? And from their point of view, well, he won't find nothing. Why don't they allow that to happen and think, well, that would be the end of me. I'd be gone. Tail between my legs, gone. Why don't they just let me have my scan if they don't think I'm going to find something? Synchronicity plays a lot in um, the Lincoln Cathedral code. And I couldn't help but smile. On the front of the newspaper, we've got X marks the spot announcing my tomb location. On the back of the sports page, what do we find? Moses to lead the way. 
Well, I am flattered. Synchronicity. Amazing. This is a very rudimentary uh, map of um, the area that we're discussing, obviously the cathedral there. Now this is a tunnel system which is based on what I know to be accurate. Either I know people that have um, had experiences of these tunnel systems, uh, and some of it has been confirmed by local government even. Uh, what we're looking at is a cathedral, we have the castle, bishop's palace. The black um, lines are showing where um, tunnel entrances are now sealed. Um, in 1963, um, I have this from a lady that was at a property here on St Steep Hill, where um, it was like a girl's home. And to cut a long story short, some girl actually who had been put down in the cellar for naughty behaviour went missing. And when the staff went to locate her, she'd. Uh, found a tunnel which led to the cathedral. That was in 1963. So this is Steep Hill. Uh, what we're looking at, um, that's the site of St Michael's Church, which is now derelict. Um, the indication is that this tunnel at this property at Steep Hill actually connected with the tunnel at St Michael's. St Michael's, interestingly enough, um, just in recent years, is a mystery buyer. Um, this is the church of St. Hugh and this is uh, the old Monk's Abbey as it was called. Now there is our marker tomb at the St. Margaret's burial ground. This is the network of tunnels. Um, what I can say is that I have accessed a tunnel in this area um, I'm certainly not going to name where it was for um, obvious reasons. Um, interestingly enough, the Bishop's Palace have confirmed that there is that there's always been a, a, a historical rumour of a tunnel at the Bishop's Palace. They, they can't locate it, but they have confirmed that. That's interesting for me. That they have confirmed there is a tunnel, and it uh, connects with um, St Margaret's, where I've was refused the GPR scan so the only way to attempt to access um, that would be through an obliging tunnel. Without going into uh, enormous detail, we're at uh, a spot where there is um, a tunnel that leads to the cathedral. It was accessed last, to my knowledge, in 1963. Um, obviously a lot has changed since then, so whether it's still available to access or not, um, I couldn't say at this moment in time. But it is right, right here in one of these properties which I won't actually nominate which one, but it is one of them that I do know of. So this has been sold to a private. We don't know, it's a genuine mystery buyer that paid over the odds. Even the estate agents won't disclose. Three well, years ago. This is one of the locations of one of you. Tunnels. Yeah, the tunnel from over there actually goes under here. And somebody's bought the location. Yeah, mystery buyer. How strange. Mr. Buyer paid, paid 200 grand over the odds for it. I did a 
foot a month ago, but this is as good as it gets. It's a marvelous derelict church. It's been rebuilt because the original was ancient. Yeah. So when we show this, this is what some people might think, hmm, the bullets have got in here somehow, got in at all. It's of course, uh, it's right at the side of the cathedral. Bishop's Palace, um, where they have confirmed to me there is a secret tunnel somewhere here, which I'm given to believe will lead to my St Margaret's crypt under the martyr tomb. Uh, obviously it's not called a secret tunnel for nothing, because they don't know where it is, but they have confirmed it's a long-term enduring story that will not go away. They do have one somewhere here. You know, it's really frustrating that you do all your hard work, you're alone with this, you know where you need to be, you sometimes get in those places even though maybe you shouldn't be there. And it's the same old story, solid, dead end, but you know, maybe the next one. <laughs> oh. I'm not exactly one for giving up. I mean, at least I'm somewhere where people tell me don't really, don't really exist, you know, these places aren't supposed to exist as such, but let's have another try, it looks similar to where I've just been, but I mean, maybe there's no dead end at the bottom, let's go and find out, I guess. Thinking here, look, a bit of limbo dancing required. Yep. On the floor. Oh, Not a good Turn away. Right, guys, let me get up first. Bite the head. That's a tight one. It certainly is. Again. Oh, are you kidding me? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> I did tell you. <laughs> oh, cool. You asked for trouble. We got it, yeah. It's a nice little chase for this one. You've got a watch to, to be able to work out how long I've been on the land. Here. 
I was told if I just carried on, I might actually find something I could be looking for. I could have done doing this about 10 years ago, I think. You know, when you do this, everybody forgets about the camera and has to do it as well, so. This one's not an easy one. You know, the thoughts just struck me that I could go on, I don't know, all bloody night or what? <laughs> if I get stuck, <laughs> I'll be stuck. <laughs> Jeez, that's not that way. Thank goodness for humour because without humour, there won't be much to laugh about down here. I think I've invented about three new backstrokes. <laughs> Tighter and tighter all the time. You know. <laughs> Thing is, I've got to go somewhere though. Uh. Ah. It just goes on forever. I'm seriously beginning to wonder where I might be. Um, here it's telling you what. Oh wait, you might need near it. Fuck. You really need an indicator to where you are. Um, but my gut feeling tells me to carry on. Otherwise I'd have given up a long while, but I'll tell you. Yeah. You don't get any medals for this. <laughs> Man, these tunnels aren't supposed to exist. Somebody said that this, this network, or whatever you want to call it, was sealed in about, I don't know, 1953, I heard. But all I've done is just carry on and on. Let's just hope I'm not coming around that one myself. But, I am. It looks a bit, just a little bit different at every twist and turn. And some walls have got gunge on. And others haven't. I used to have friends that worked down a pit in the northeast of England and they hated the job. So I can bloody see why. And it just goes on and on. It's getting narrower actually. Um, yeah. There's lots of them. I'll put it again here, yeah, mate. There's lots of them kind of lead to this very point. Um, I don't know if that's for any particular reason or important. Um, but I'm in the area that I really, really think I should be. Hey, this is an interesting one. It's bloody well sealed as well. Um, you know, this is the first one. Um, it's kind of sealed, but the rest you've just cut, you know, you just carry on and on and on and on. Um, but this one, it's definitely well sealed. Um, there's no chance I can do anything about that. Um, I really need to come back, but I don't know what, what, 
you can try and smash it there, but you don't feel safe at the best of times. That's the first one uh, that is actually sealed. And lots of the pathways, tools, whatever, seem to kind of like lead um, in this general direction. Amongst all my research, there's something that it clearly disturbs me. I'm, I mean, we are definitely dealing with a, a historical Jesus figure and a historical Mary Magdalene and the Knights Templar, and a bloodline apparently um, from Mary Magdalene um, being pregnant and carrying Jesus' child. But what really nags at me is the painting of. Um, the Last Supper by Da Vinci, where the figure next to, which is obviously Mary Magdalene, is, is Peter, making this rather unpleasant gesture. And also there is in the painting a disembodied hand wielding a knife. Now, whereas most researchers are happy to say that, you know, a pregnant Magdalene did give birth and a bloodline to this day was resultant I have this terrible, terrible nagging doubt that maybe Mary Magdalene and Child were demised and that therefore there is no bloodline and that that is the real secret of Renly Chateau which concludes in Lincoln that a bloodline was terminated. used to be. The, this is where the Templars were imprisoned. They were probably thrown down here actually.
this is where they shot scenes for the Hollywood uh, Dundrum blockbuster, The Da Vinci Code. And where we're about to go is the chapter house where the Knights Templars were tried, sentenced and imprisoned in Lincoln Castle. several books on, or a couple of books on the Lincoln Da Vinci Code, um, which are all over the internet, is infamous on YouTube and various other sites, um, lots of articles about basically the same stuff as the Da Vinci Code, but in Lincoln, England. Um, so uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Callum Jensen on the show. Welcome to the world of Dan Green. Yeah, <laughs> welcome to the world of Dan Green. Now, Dan Green, that's obviously a ploy. We'll let the viewers work that one out. So, I have a note here that says, before we talk about Lincoln Cathedral Da Vinci Code, I need to ask you about your Tibetan Buddhist background. I think it's, it's fair to me that people understand a little bit about um, long, long ago where um, my interests first um, led me into this, where I am today, I suppose. Mm. Um, I read uh, that the Tibetans had chronicled 49 levels of consciousness. Now, I've lived my life in Newcastle in the northeast of England and I thought we only know two levels of consciousness sober and drunk <laughs> so I thought I've got to know about this so I, you know getting more serious um, I went to a place in Scotland where there's authentic Tibetan refugees it's Karma Kaju Samai Ling in Dumfries you can't say that drunk no no and um, I stayed there quite a while and had um, uh, oral instruction from um, a genuine Rinpoche teacher right. who's still with us now. I learnt uh, Kala Chakra Vajrayana, which is quite heavy stuff, mm -hmm. and neurological. Um, because, you know, two and a half thousand years ago, these guys, you know, were producing like Hindu and Vedic mantras that if enunciated correctly, were changing enzymes in the brain mm -hmm. to change people's consciousness. Now, how could they have come up with those mantras two and a half thousand years ago? when our modern day science of neurology is just a newborn baby. How did they have access to that? Mm. So I think we're touching on the ultimate mystery, which is mind. Because I, 
you know, we, we live our lives using about a fifth of the capacity of our brain. If we could access the four fifths, the subconscious mind, mm. where I believe is the answers, solutions to all the usual world mysteries, mm. if we could access that area, then perhaps the world wouldn't be such a mysterious place, mm. but you can't access it. You're talking very much about the mystical experience. Absolutely. It, puts, it, it throws you into a realm of esoteric mysticism. Mm. Yeah. And that has helped you come up with the discovery, is it? Well, um, this is where I learned about the collective unconscious and archetypes, mm. um, synchronicities, where lots of events synchronise like this. And like the Lincoln Cathedral Code invites one to ringside seats to the pyrotechnics of the collective unconscious and its tools of synchronicity and archetypes. Mm. So you're obviously deeply into Carl Jung. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah, great, great. The, the man who came up with many of those terms you've just used. Absolutely. Who, who's, it's it's who's... the realm of psychology, but you know, going back to the Far East, they were like the cradle of psychology two and a half thousand years ago. They mm. knew about mind stuff and brain yeah. stuff that we're, ju we're just trying to understand now. How this could they the, do that? Well, this is the stuff that excited Jung so much, isn't it? That, that, that this, this was ancient psychology. That, uh, and that the best way of dealing with your mind is to get into that. And pursuing it, I think yeah. he had mystical experiences as well. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I refer to myself as like a neurologist. I'm not particularly, oh, you know, solutions lie in the paranormal. I think all solutions can be translated into a science that we'll eventually understand. Mm. But I use like the tools of synchronicity and archetypes um, to aid and abet me in um, my work, which... So you're kind of consciously seeking synchronicities? You know, you can't force them to happen, they just happen all the time, but researchers have said that once you notice synchronicities around you, they happen fast and furious. Yeah, yeah. Like I have about six to buy a specific kind of car, suddenly you see them everywhere. Yeah, I perhaps could tell a story about it later on, you know, yeah. about six synchronicities before breakfast. And it's not paranormal, <laughs> when I was young you would think Good this title is, for a book, right? You'd think this is paranormal, but it's, it's natural, yeah. if only we can understand it. Yeah. It could take another 50 years before we'd understand yeah. it, maybe. Yeah. But a lot of people have tried to do that through sacred geometry and, and maths. And this all as... Um, which is related entirely this to... This is it. all, you know, I found myself in this mystery. It's mm. almost as if I didn't look for it, it found me. Mm. And that's what we call serendipity, <laughs> which is part of the psychology that we're discussing. So, you know, before, before we get on to the, the Da Vinci Code of Lincoln, yes. what, what, tell us about this 1986... Right, um, you know, I read about the, the Holy Blood, the Holy Grail, which was the mystery at the time, yeah. 1982, sold a million copies, Renle Chateau, you know, mm. forget all the mysteries, pyramids, whatever, it's yeah. now Renle Chateau, there's a mystery there somehow. Yeah. Determining the nature of what it was meant you had to go there. Um, now, I'll tell this exactly how it happened, you know, bear in mind that I, I don't favour paranormal and stuff, I'm a neurologist, scientist, if you like. but. Because the brain, that four-fifth that we, we mentioned you can't access, mm -hmm. seems to have no uh, respect for time and space. It can <laughs> skip it. So in the dream world, you can get sort of information that may well check out, mm. okay? I don't think that's too unscientific no. to see in this day and age. So I was intending to go to Renle Chateau, and I got this date in a dream. It's not the sort of thing that happens to me all the time, but I've got it's 24th of April, 24th of April, 24th of April. And Lacoum came with it. Now, I can't even speak French, but 24th of April, Lacoum. Cut a long story short, you know, I thought we must be at Renner Chateau 24th of April. It's something. You know, I don't know, don't understand. So anyway, when we got there, um, there was a chap who left his home in Bordeaux and he built his own little house to live there, Stone Hut, very like a Navajo Indian, how he built it. And he called it Lacoum, he had the name on it. Right. So I thought, right. Cut a long story short, because I'm going to have to do time-wise. And we had quite an adventure at Renlund Shout on that day. We'd found a, a tomb in the area of uh, Le Labadou. Mm. It was sealed, there was two points of entry and it was sealed. Now you have to bear in mind, Ren Shadow fanatics are always looking for tombs, mm. you know, it's Jesus, Mary Magdalene, whatever their interpretation is. But we'd found this tomb there and had quite an exciting day. I do know that that tomb that we visited was known to Elizabeth Van Boon, who lived in the area, David Wood, Sacred Geometry, they knew about this tomb. So I'm not saying I was the only person that found this sealed tomb, could be important, whatever. But that was part of the, the day's adventure. Eight o'clock at night, uh, we're kind of 
hanging with this, this guy, this French guy, who's still in the valley today. He still lives there, apparently. Mm -hmm. Eight o'clock at night, well, still quite light it was, because it was April. We spotted three bright lights on the horizon above the precipice of a mountain, looking just like stars. So I thought, oh, that's very eye-catching, suddenly. Well, they started moving. Yeah. Right. And uh, the next thing you know, they did vanish from sight, and there was this like really strange, like cloud, amber coloured. Uh, there was no thunder, but there was lightning. So that's a really weird scene mm. to see this massive cloud heading your way. For all, all the world, a storm, but you associate thunder with a storm, no thunder, just these lightning flashes, red um, amber cloud, silently over the valley, over our heads. Went around the famous Renlin Chateau and gone. Now, that's what people do call an unidentified flying object. Now, mm. I'm not saying spaceships and aliens, that was an unidentified flying object. So I'm left with the assumption to assume that, you know, that was like a date calculation for some reason. I had to be at that place at that time to witness whatever mm. that was. How did you feel? Well, apart from, you know, it's so. There was no other signs of life in the valley at the time. Mm. Did you have a profound feeling? That you'd it did something? fit. It, 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 there was like a, a wash, silence, you know, silence. The sound of silence is interesting, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, and, and then the synchronicities, you know, lacoom. And you think of the great Spielberg movie, Close Encounters. Yeah. The scientist in there who had the encounter was called Lacoum. Really? Yeah. And he was styled <laughs> on Jacques Vallée, the actual UFO investigator and physicist. And we were in the Rennes Valley. Right. So, you know, there's all these synchronicities. Hello. Right. Um, so that was the, the Rennes Le Chateau adventure. Now, mm. I can't explain what that was all about. Mm. Like finding a tomb that was not accessible. Um, and then this kind of encounter or whatever. So if there was a message in any of this, you've not really picked that up? Well, no, and I was quite happy to say, right, I've done the Renle Shuttle thing now, you know, it's just a matter of opinion how we interpret these things. Mm. But then 20 years later, I, I'd been kind of like drawn. It's hard to explain why people move where they move. Mm. You know, sometimes it's like that scene in, um, Jason and the Argonauts, where the gods are in Olympus, and they're picking humans up and dropping them on the chessboard and stuff like that. One of my favourite movies. Uh, so, circumstances brought me to Lincoln in 1979. Didn't stay very long. Scotted back up north. Circumstances brought me to Lincoln in 1987. Stayed a while. Not particularly enamoured. Scotted back up north. Circumstances brought me to Lincoln in 1999. I stayed, and in 2005, found myself entangled, or the prime mover in, in this Renle Chateau coming to Lincoln. You know, the quest seemed to have been moved to Lincoln, and I, I was the only guy that seemed to be spotting this, 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 my goodness. Now, one of the real potent synchronicities here so you have to smile, is that in this country, the guy who initially brought the Renly Shuttle mystery to our attention had the name Henry Lincoln. And he went looking for stuff in France. There's the serendipity again. How, how bizarre, okay? And then, if, you know, I, I'm doing this work uh, on the Lincoln Cathedral Code, and then, bang, next thing you know, Hollywood's come to England come to Lincoln Cathedral to shoot scenes for the Da Vinci Code in Lincoln Cathedral. Mm. Synchronicity, coincidence, whatever. Mm. Uh, and all my research and, and work on the, the Lincoln Cathedral Code is absolutely repeat, replete with coincidences, synchronicities. It's almost as if it's pushing you like that. Mm. And I'm just following it, the paper chase. Mm. I'm just following the paper chase. And you've you know, not been fearful at all of, of of, you know, incredulous people looking at you and going, you're just a loony. Right. Um, well, I, per perfectly open. I, I do, I do approach it in a scientific sense that people can actually follow. It's not as far out as you think, you know. It's just that, well, I've got the courage, if you like, to take that next That's step. That's what I meant. You've had the courage to just do this. Whereas others would go, well, no, well, this is just... Well, sometimes, you know, Philip, you know, you, you feel like thinking, I can't be bothered with this. I've got to live a normal life like other people. I've got to go to work and stuff like that. And you feel like you've been pushed through a hoop, you know? I know the feeling. 
you know the feelings yeah. here, well. Yeah. You know, maybe we are. This is the mystery of life we don't uh, understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is... Question, so, question you've put down here. Talk a bit about the two René parchments. Right, the um, cathedral. I, I mean, people who aren't familiar with René Le Chateau mystery um, might be a little bit lost at this stage, but um, quickly, you know, um, a, a parish priest um, suddenly almost got rich overnight, mm -hmm. you know. He'd obviously stumble across something that made him a wealthy person. Berenger Sonia. Berenger Sonia. And nobody's really successfully um, deduced exactly what it was, but there's a million and one clues, of mm -hmm. course. And this became the Renly Shadow mystery. First thing he did was decorate his church in very bizarre fashion with all sorts of stuff that... But according to Bajant Lee and Lincoln, it was probably down to these some paperwork that he discovered. Right, or, or perhaps knew about but or didn't discover about. himself. Okay. We don't really know. Yeah. Um, so there was two parchments in the main that Sonia discovered, and people argue over what they may well mean. Mm -hmm. A few people have said, look, you know, we think this is it, definitely. It, it's open to interpretation. So I looked at it, and um, suddenly, before my very eyes, stage by stage, it was unveiling itself in conjunction with um, anomalies and, 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 and signs and symbols, all in Lincoln Cathedral. Now, you know, a coincidence in most people's mind is something that might happen once or twice, mm. but when things keep going on and on and on, you think, well, mm. there's, there's something more to it mm. than this. So, Dan, Callum. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about this, uh, the text in the parchment. I'll quickly go through that. These are the parchments that nobody successfully decoded. Um, it's going to sound very strange. Shepherdess, no temptation. That's the first part. Now, um, Queen Eleanor, who's high up a buttress on the southeast corner of Lincoln Cathedral, is looking directly over to the burial grounds of St. Margaret, who was a shepherdess. Nobody's ever pointed it out, but Eleanor is actually pregnant in the sculpture in stone. Right. If you stand for an angle, you can clearly see that. Right. Uh, and no temptation. She's pregnant, so as a sexual object, there's no temptation. Okay, yeah. uh, that Poussin Teniers hold the KP681, the famous painters who painted clues in the Rendler Shadow mm -hmm. mystery. Uh, Poussin painted Shepherds of Arcadia, so we're back to that little piece. And Teniers painted a, a fantastic um, um, painting called. Um, the cabinet of Archduke Leopold in 1651. There's 55 actual paintings in the, the one painting, mm. but the central one that everyone's looking at is St. Margaret. <laughs> right. And we're going to arrive at St. Margaret's burial ground, so that explains that. Um, 681, um, there's a sundial um, around the area we talked about, the cathedral, and strangely enough, the numerals don't start before six. And the 681 is the equal spacing of the number six. Eight, one, right. the one in ten. That explains that sundial, important. Um, by the cross and this horse of God, I complete this demon guardian. If you go to the mercy seat in the choir stalls within the cathedral, hidden away under one of the seats is a wonderful little carving that nobody really understands. It's a knight falling off a horse. The horse's legs are crossed. So by this um, cross and this horse of God, that explains that also, right. it's important. I complete this demon guardian at midday blue apples. Now, Lincoln Cathedral has the famous Lincoln imp in there, that is enacting the role of the demon guardian. Now, how do we complete him at midday blue apples? Well, the blue apples bit is quite interesting too because on the 22nd of July at 12 o'clock, it's very Anna Jones stuff, but it's very accurate also. Uh, 12 o'clock midday on the 22nd of July, which mm -hmm. is the Feast of Mary Magdalene, mm -hmm. the sun shines through a specific pane on the glass in the cathedral. It's red and blue and cast inside a dappling effect on the ground of red, blue, and it looks like what people refer to as dancing apples. <laughs> it's really fantastic and spectacular. So that explains that one. Um, some, some texts uh, um, alternatively say complete or, or destroy the demon guardian um, at midday. But how we can do either is to go back to the sundial because there's a Latin uh, motto there. Um, Periunt et imputanto. 
is inscribed on the 681 sundial. Mm -hmm. And that loosely translates as, and it's talking about hours because of time, it says, they perish and are credited to our account. So the demon guardian can be destroyed, perishes. Or, if you like, um, the demon guardian can be completed because you take Lincoln imp and complete the word impu imputanto, <laughs> which is on the dial. That covers a lot. Now, the odds of somebody being able to do that in one place mm. is astronomical. Yeah. Because so they all interlock. You're it becomes more than a coincidence, it starts to become this thing. Absolutely. And the second parchment, uh, for king and scion is his treasure and it is death. Very enigmatic. In the precincts of Lincoln Cathedral is a statue of uh, Tennyson, the port, port laureate. Mm. He did the famous Holy Grail port. Mm. It's loaded with cryptic stuff in there. Yeah, it's um, it. But uh, for king and for scion is his treasure and it is death. In acrostic, written on the plaque, you've got R-O-I, which is French for king, and it also interacts with scion, which is spent, spelt on the plaque as well. So you've got king and you've got scion. This treasure is death. Where else would you expect death other than a burial grounds, Absolutely. which is where this quest ends, St. Margaret's burial grounds. So you've got a little bit of video to go a little bit, bit deeper into this for yes, us. Yes, a little bit of tape first, and then I'll explain exactly how we arranged X marks this spot. So if we can cue the, uh, the video, we'll, we'll take a look. You can put this together for us. It's uh, Eleanor looking straight over at the tomb directly. Directly. She's a shepherdess looking at St. Margaret's burial ground. Mm. Her, her eye level is directly at the tomb. You'll see the tomb. It's directly in line with the tomb. <laughs> staring directly at it. As a clue, she's staring directly at it. There it is, that black monolith. We're taking a closer look at the monolith. Mm. It's a family tomb called Reina. And you can't pronounce Reina without pronouncing the French word Reina, mm. which is French for queen. And we'll sort off the piece in this uh, puzzle. We also have the name next to it. That, that tomb right next to it is no more than half an inch away. It's just so natural that two tombs are, are, are segued together. It has the name Mary on it also. Mm. And the Rainer team, tomb has Martha on it as well. It's very biblical. We're looking at a location under there. Uh, a chap from the Royal Academy of Art quit the Royal Academy of Art to join uh, Lincoln Cathedral and become um, the canon there. He painted this and gave it to the cathedral. It's supposed to be the Annunciation of Mary. You can clearly see that is not uh, uh, the, the usual depiction of uh, Mary the Virgin. Mm. The, uh, Margaret Starbird, who I showed this to, says it clearly shows the sacred feminine. That's not Mary the Virgin, it's Mary Magdalene. Mm. And she's looking over at our tomb there pregnant. She's looking over at our tomb, which is outside the cathedral. And on top of that, scrolls, documents, it seems. Station of the Cross. Take a look at the bottom. What's that dog doing there? Doesn't belong in the picture. We'll see it again in a moment. What's that dog doing there? We go to the Great East Window, 64 roundels, that's a chessboard. Now we're going to go to a specific one. It's the scene of the Last Supper, and instead of a loaf of bread or a glass of wine, Jesus Christ is looking at the dog on the plate. Oh, yeah. What's the dog doing there? It's the same dog we've just seen at the Station of the Cross. It's the same dog that accompanies Tennyson outside on his statue. <laughs> not once, not twice, three times, folks. Do you give an interpretation as to why the dog? Yeah, it seems to do with every Masonic lodge has got the blazing star, and that's supposed to be a reference to the dog star Sirius. Right. So it seems to be Freemasonic. Now, how, how we arrive at X marks the spot is when we go back to uh, by this horse and cross of God. Um, the studs on, on, on the horse is uh, seven on one side, then you've got the cross legs of the horse, and there's four on the other. So you multiply seven by four, you get 28. Okay, mm. think, okay. But if we go to Renly Shadow for a moment, one of the best clues ever put there, painted himself by Berenger Sonnier, was this picture here of the Magdalene kneeling in a cave, in a grotto. Now, if you draw a straight line through her eye level, through the center of her cross, mm. it hits on this decoration on the outside. Yeah on the 28th one along. 
So, so she's got, staring at the 28th. She's absolutely staring at the 28th one along. Now this is a major clue nobody's ever really sorted out. Now if you go to our tomb where we've just seen and stand there yeah. and orientate yourself as you would in that picture, you will see that there and it is clearly, if you could stand there yourself, you might agree, it is Lincoln Castle. <laughs> I've took people there and that's the one that gets them filled. When they stand there and look at that, and look at that, and bear in mind everything that's led them there, it's well beyond coincidence. Well, I mean, I have to say, this is the damn sight more fascinating than the Da Vinci Code, which I thought was incredibly boring. <laughs> uh, and this is just a fraction of, yeah. of, of all the I things. Know, there's, like, there's can I just more. say that the arms of Lincoln is the fleur de lis. Lincoln Cathedral is in the shape of the, cro uh, the, shape of the Lorraine, cross of Lorraine. Lorraine yeah. We've got a Jerusalem, a place name, three miles outside of Lincoln, Jerusalem. Nobody knows why we ever had it. Lincoln used to be a walled city, like Jerusalem. I think we're going to have to have you back on, Dan, to go into this well, don't forget, a lot deeper. Don't forget, <laughs> Philip, I approached Lincoln Cathedral and said, can I have a GPR scan on my location? Yeah. Below that tomb is where everything is led. It's something of vast importance, one yeah. would assume, if we believe the Renly Shadows um, hype. I was going to pay for it myself. They actually announced publicly I could have the scan. And? And when it came to doing it, they changed their mind and said, you can't have it. Why? Well, here I am, it's the middle of the night, setting off to go to Norway to meet a very unusual Viking man who's made an incredible discovery. This is really quite exciting. I mean, they produced, like, dare I say, a talisman on a very, very grand scale. I mean, it's so huge that it's uh, quite unbelievable. You have to have the knowledge and you have to have of course, the golden mean, because this is the key to the whole thing, really. And without it, you would never find it. But when you know that that is the key, you can unlock it and you can find the design. That city is now called Trondheim, but it's only been, been called that for the last few hundred years. Its original name is Nidaros, Nidar, serpent in Celtic, and Ros, old knowledge. So actually, the city was called uh, Old Serpent Knowledge. <laughs> That's, uh, that is fascinating. <laughs> What Harold's discovered is remarkable. It's massive. It's as big as the Great Wall of China or the Great Pyramids of Egypt. But it's something that had to be hidden. He discovered a circle on the ground that measured 666. He discovered a pentagram upside down. And he discovered the serpent. Three images that we are told and have been told for an awful long time are symbols of evil. The truth. The 
truth is that these are symbols of wisdom, symbols of greater knowledge. And that's what I leave Norway with.